Thank you, Mohamed, for this nice introduction. Um, um, the plan is actually to, to give an overview a bit about photonics. As you can see, I'm a photon guy, and then show the current state-of-the-art architectures and, and roadmaps that we have in mind for scaling up those things. And then I would like to sneak over to the things that we like to do in Vienna. Is we like to investigate new twists, new protocols. In our case here, we like security aspects. That's the reason I would like to, um, to, uh, to talk about a nice, nice things that photons basically allow you to do. Coming from Vienna, or from Austria, actually, I never get tired to show this very famous phrase. Okay? So when you read here, uh, somebody said some years ago, we never experiment with just one electron atom. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do this invariably entails ridiculous consequences. We are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise each to Saudia in the zoo. Who was saying this? Ah, uh, wrong, wrong audience. Okay, of course, yes. Um, but it's still surprising that actually it's not so long ago. I mean, like nowadays we have those, those nice things in the lab. And um, being here at GQI, you know you have this very beautiful experience with photons and ions and others. And you see uh, basically that each platform nowadays has its uh, own territory. And it's really exciting, exciting times. No matter what you have in mind, computing, metrology, whatever. I think it's really like a, you're surfing on the wave, so to say, with this kind of quantum, quantum research. Um, so let's go back to photons. I'm a photon guy and I like photons because they're allowed to do so many things. There's the really rich systems for many applications. Um, they're the obvious choice for communication. They uh, have been used since the early days for investigating entanglement because it's rather straightforward to get it from these down conversion processes. Um, they're also natural charts in metrology if you go to the Heisenberg limit of single photons or entangled states. And now for uh, almost 20 years it's known in principle you can do computing by um, taking single photos and getting non-linearities, which is how to get by measurements. So that takes me to the next slide um, about photonic systems, what's good and what's bad. So the good thing is they don't interact, which is nice, because normally systems suffer from the environment, so the, the coherent photons don't do except losses. Um, they are uh, fast. Nothing is faster than a photon. They, they really fly at the speed of light. Um, you have amazing single qubit control. So nowadays what you achieve with whatever, touching the photon, changing polarization, path degree frame, Really, it's outstanding. So there's really has been also a dramatic progress in the last couple of years. Um, you don't need vacuums in principle. It's also nice to build up on, an, on a breadboard or an optics table. People can do it in reasonable time because there's no vacuum needed. You don't need uh, complicated whatever, laser arrangements. So it's, it's a handy system, which partially is also the reason why people did not investigate so much in engineering that they have this constant progress other systems had, which are very hard to control. Of course, the downside is there's no interaction. And that means we have to find clever solutions how we can still make them interact, which is an important ingredient for gate operations and other things that we need, or to generate entanglement, because you need interactions to, to get those. Well, if you talk about qubits, what do we do normally? Well, we take the internal degrees of freedom, the polarization state of encode, zero is one polarization, one the other polarization. You can nicely change it by wave plates as shown here. And this basically gives you address, uh, allows you to address the qubit. If you like other degrees of freedom, you can also take, for example, path where one photon is here or there, and the superposition here in principle allows you also to tune where the photon can be found and the state in the path encoded freedom. Well, this one actually was popular in the beginning polarization, but the progress in integrated optics uh, moved now that many experiments are considered more in the path degree of freedom because you have access to silicon photonics, to so integrated optics. And what people do is they build these kind of devices where um, uh, photon comes in, and basically, the distance here between these two couplings, if an S and light field coupled, and it can really prepare here at the end arbitrary position states, superposition states of the photon in a very stable way because it's monolithic. And that's an important feature for, for scaling up things. So, as I said, it's, there's a very high level of quantum control for single qubit operations, and nowadays you really achieve errors in the order of 10 to minus 8. That means with that precision, you can really adjust uh, the qubit state by building devices like this, when you have these two modes and you put them together by beam splitter here, beam splitter there, and playing with the phase as shown here. And phase normally means you change the length by putting a little heater, for example. Uh, you can really put, uh, get any possible state of this uh, two qubit system at the end. Um, so, coming back to what we do in the laboratory, we love to have those things, but we don't do them. We don't build them. But luckily, the experts are around, and currently we have a few collaborations, one with Dirk Englund from MIT, and we operate now a bigger device where the same as before we have now this chip with 26 input modes 
then you see how basically here this phase shift, there's these heaters which each can be controlled individually, which is a pain in, in reality because you have to find mechanisms to control them nicely. There's sometimes crosstalk, you know, this basically is coming from an academic fab, so there's always some kind of bugs that you have to fix. Here you see this little Mach 10 as shown before, beam speed to beam speed, and you tune these phase shifters by heaters, and at the end, basically, we can really control in the single photon state coming out. And we currently run experiments for simulation. We'll not talk about those. The first run was just a single photon that we used for some communication task. We have this counterfactual communication, which I might talk later. Well, that goes nicely. Integrated optics is really a promising hardware ingredient. The challenge, actually, is the single photon source. It seems that nature fights very hard to give us no single photons for free. And um, what are the, the sources that can be used? Uh, uh, still old-fashioned, but at the moment, very strong candidates still are those down conversion sources where we take a nonlinear crystal, a Chi2 material, where blue photon comes, and in this case, a blue photon comes. And then there's a small probability that by this nonlinear effect, spontaneous emission happens, and two red photons come out. And if, you have, if they have orthogonal polarization, you take them from cross-sections, and you get these entangled pairs with extremely high quality. But probabilistic, so you never know when this is happening, which of course leads to true limitations. The other sources that have like a revival nowadays are solid state emitters, and in particular quantum dot sources, um, where you have, um, as you get shown here, quantum dots surrounded by cavity to enhance basically the cell effect of the emission. And they really, there's even companies like Condella in France and others in, 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 in what the name in, in Denmark, they can purchase nowadays these sources. What do they give you? Well, they give you single photons, normally the entangled ones. They're also entangled ones, but the majority are single photons, which is awesome. And it's, it's, the, it's the lowest level that you need because you want at the end single photons that are pure. Uh, we basically have the same frequency, the same property, that at the end you can combine them and defeat them at these gates as basically the, the, the system for, for doing the computation. Um, so, well, they are nice, but as I said, they don't give you entanglement. That means at the end you have to have an overhead and other beam splitters and gates to still have an entangled system. Therefore, there's still an interesting um, basically approach to use down conversion. We have a study of entangled pairs. What do we do in the laboratories nowadays? Well, we move to a wavelength that's nice for fibers. That's the so-called telecom wavelength. So nowadays, everybody tries to work at 50 and 50 nanometers, where losses are minimal. Um, we have not one sources, but up to three or four sources that gives us six or eight photons at the end. We take past lasers and increase the repetition rates to even enhance here the emission rates. What we do nowadays, well, we, we build this kind of nonlinear crystals in a loop that allows us to get entangled pairs by having a laser going either this way or that way, and you don't know if HV or VH were now emitted. You see, now you have this kind of everything in one mode that also enhances the collection efficiency because all the emitted photons are now really coming in the same mode, and you don't lose them by having the ring. So, and then at the end, by having the proper uh, uh, the chroic mirrors, we separate the laser and get our entangled photons out here, which come either from this way or that way, it means HVVH, and we get this also very high quality. The downside is shown here. Uh, a probabilistic source means that the counts go down if you look for having, the, having more photons at the same time. So typically we have a million counts per second at the detector, detectors. We go for four qubits, four photons, it's only a thousand. And if you go further down to six qubits or more, we're in, in, in the Hertz regime means you have to wait quite some time to get our entangled states, okay? And that's, that's the limiting factor where people try to overcome this uh, exponential scaling by using switches and so on. Good. Um, in reality, what we do is, so we, um, for example, we still like to play with six qubit systems to investigate whatever new properties, uh, whatever new, new protocols or new whatever characterization methods. So what we do here is then we take those resources as before, we take optical elements, which can be very handy at the end when we get, for example, such a six qubit cluster state that we used recently for um, uh, demonstrating a very nice um, enhanced witness method where just a few <laughs> measurements, um, 20 measurements are enough to really characterize or prove this state is what you think you should have. And that was interesting to many people because it's way more efficient than taking tomography and so on. We have these millions and thousands of measurements um, going on. But I rather move on to where we are right now with technology. So sources are still challenging. Uh, the circuitry seems pretty on the, on the right track of integrated optics. Now we have detection. Okay, detection made a big jump in the last five or 10 years where the superconducting technology was improved so much that we can use it now for detecting uh, low energy photons at silicon wavelength. 
okay, that was the bottleneck. And now we really have to take this with more than 93%, even 96 where the room is currently for nanowires, where you lose a, lose a superconducting element, where when a photon comes, basically you destroy the superconductivity, and you see a change in the resistance of the superconductor, which tells you, yes, there was a photon, okay? And right now we operate those, which is nice, because now we can work a telecom wavelength. And what even now this, um, this nanotechnology allows you to do, these nanowire detectors are good because they're fast, okay? So they recover quickly when the photon comes, and you can see the next guy again, okay? The other systems, which are even more efficient, but they take forever to recover, which kills your count rates if you have to wait a millisecond until your detector is ready to see the next photon. So nanowires are a good combination, they're fast, and they, they're efficient, but they cannot tell you how many photons arrive. They're not photon number resolving. <coughs> and the nice feature about technology is, well, you can build the device to become pseudo number resolving in the way that you have now a detection unit. You put four, you see these colors here, green, yellow, blue, and red. Each of, them is each of those is a detector. So now you can put those four together where the photon comes here on the spot, which has two advantages. A, it's smaller material, so they recover even faster because it's not so much of metal that has been has to basically has, has to become cold again. And they basically if two photons come, there's this probability that they split up and different detectors see those. So with those you have a 75% chance when two photons come that they go to different detectors and tell you yes, there was a photon there. So that helps you at least to get an insight about the photon numbers you had, which is important to know if there was noise happening or some other systems, some other failures showed up in your system. Good. Is it, it's pseudo numbers. So you cannot tell how many photons arrive, but if two photons arrive at the spot, and they go to different detectors, like beam splitters. You split them up probabilistically, and if two detectors fire, you say, okay, I know there are two photons coming. And they're pretty efficient. So these curves here, too small for reading, unfortunately, in the back probably. But you see, each of those nanowires has an efficiency of 22% times 4. So each here there's this 95, no, 90%, basically, um, or even higher than 22 here because times four is the entire efficiency here, which, which really tells you how, how good the system is. So long story short, to t Yes. Yes, that's the reason it's a pseudo number. So it means it's not, there's a case you don't see it. That's the reason there's a chance of 75% that two photons will split up, okay? And at the end, with well, we result, it helps a lot because if there's noise contribution and down conversion, you can truncate now suddenly if an extra photon is, came from somewhere you improve the fidelity at the end of the, of the process. Good. Um, that's my thing with two, the force about photonic framework and hardware. I would like to still use a few more slides to um, bring you on the same page about the architectures that are existing for, for building photonic quantum computers. Uh, most of you probably might know there was this work now from 2001, which are milestone uh, theory work, showing that actually photonic quantum computing can be done because the nonlinearity that you need, as so a senior as the photons come in as qubits, and then you want to process by these gates, not gates, C not gates, and so on. These nonlinearities can be achieved by measuring extra photons, so called ancillar photons, where the measurement process acts as the nonlinearity that affects the other ones. With those, with those, you have to have, those who were entangled, and basically, by that, you drive the system by those measurements. It's actually worth to know that they had in mind to show the opposite. They had in mind to show photonics cannot be used for quantum computing. And they got the opposite result. Okay? That's at least the version from NIL. And they basically had this big paper who kicked off the field. The downside is, well, if you look at the paper, they have a tremendous overhead of extra photons that are needed to drive the system. And as you've seen, photons are hard to get. So there's, a, there's basically a, the challenge, um, how far can we go with sources to really have these millions of photons in the system? Well, at the same time, this other architecture came uh, on the screen, this measurement-based quantum computing, where I guess most of you are familiar with. Uh, the idea is now in contrast to the circuit model where you have to build circuits and gates, you start with this highly entangled cluster state, which gives you all the resources for computing, and then everything is easy. You just make measurements consecutively, which drive stepwise to computation. For computer scientists, and still now it is the case, they made a paradigm shift in computing because what, what a cluster state is, it's a complete set of all possible answers, okay? And you get the right answer by asking the question stepwise. And remarkably, the effort to ask the right questions is as hard as starting from scratch the circuit model where you build the results. So it's something where people think about what does nature tell us if these two totally different concepts which somehow still are linked together. Um, but the point of measurement-based computing is they are measurements. Okay? And measurements is something photons need 
So it's obvious that this opened the door then for uh, photonic implementations because we need measurements anyways. So the photon was there. Why don't we use it right away for computing in one hand? And then nowadays, as we have this noisy intermediate scale computing, and that's something photons also have in mind, which means in our case, we do computations which are tailored to the good things of photons, even though they're not universal. Okay? So for example, some things are like these kind of random walks that come in a second. Can be done nicely with photons, just linear optics, really not much overhead. They can still do interesting computations without those complicated things that would be needed for universal computing, either with this model or that model. Good. Um, however, um, there are nice blueprints, and I would like to summarize those. As I mentioned, the one way model, which has this intrinsic measurement as the, as, the, as, the, as the thing to drive the computation, is something that's nice for photons. It goes back this work actually to von Briegel. If you have not read the paper, recommend it's really nice to read the, the first, the first basically introduction to this concept from, from those guys. And to summarize on one slide with um, a lot of simplification, it goes the following the computation. You start if this qubit's in a plus state, you're entangled by a C phase gate, basically this kind of set set interactions, which are hard to do. That's basically the challenge. And then you get these entangled states. And now you drive the computation by measuring this photon or this qubit. And you have, with the certain rules, you have to choose a particular basis between this x, y plane of the plus sphere. You choose a basis here. And the measurement here transfer this information from this qubit to that qubit by this angle that you've chosen here for defining the basis. It's very well defined. Okay? But that really drives the system uh, through. And you also can implement effective nonlinear gates because you have entanglement already in the system. Um, it's a very short summary, but I guess most of you now just learn this anyways in 101 on quantum mechanics, so I, I rather go on to implementations with photons, what's currently the idea to do. Um, well, the challenge is obviously how we get those entangled states, and if you go to photons and don't find a smart solution, then you take regular optics, beam splitters, where you take entangled pair here, entangled pair there, and then you try to fuse them by just beam splitters. Unfortunately, in linear optics, those things are probabilistic. There's no way to have, in the simplest case, a better success rate than 50%. Okay? There's tons of literature to show, can you optimize in different schemes? But long story short, the best thing you can do is just 50%, which means half of the time you, you end up in nothing or just noise. And the other half of the time, you really have this nice fusion gate here. And people design beam splitters or polarizing beam splitters, as shown here, as those elements for driving the computation. And even nice schemes where you know when it happened and, and, and so on. Um, but the challenge was, is this useful at the end? Because it seems like if you have half the time success rate, one half to the power of n steps means you go down to zero rapidly. You know? Of course, even though it's nice in the, in the simple experiment, but it doesn't help a lot. And then there was something interesting happening. People looked at these cluster states, these graphs, and wanted to understand better the concepts. And they realized, wait a second. Um, if you start with a system that's really big enough, then 50% of success rate to connect neighbored bonds are still good because at the end you still have um, managed to have all the bonds connected. So it's about percolation and fusion. Percolation, you know, is the thing when coffee goes through the, the grind. What's the English word for that? Are you the expert somewhere else? Okay. You need to shoot another coffee. But it's <laughs> so at the, the basic percolation people means here, even when, when bonds break, because you just have 50% success rate, overall, there are enough, enough bonds there, as shown here, these lines, okay, that by reshuffling the qubits, you have a successful cluster state that can be used for universal computing. So if you know which bond is not there, you can find a different path. You say, no, imagine not you, but rather this guy, and you find your path at the end that information doesn't get lost, and you still have a, a network that takes you to the end where you uh, can read out the result. And it was impressive to see that 50% is sufficient if you have five qubit, um, qubit stars in the beginning, and then at the end you always find some way of smart uh, relabeling to, to, to have a connected graph somewhere with these highways. Okay? That was basically shown not by these guys, but actually by Jens Eisert and other people previously. Well, five is not easy to start with. So the interesting challenge was that people can be start with simpler uh, initial conditions, so to say. And the answer is yes. So currently the best uh, situation is, well, we limit ourselves to two dimensions. Okay? So because we want to work basically in linear optics just along a certain direction, like chips, they rather go 
you know, chip is like 2D and not 3D. You don't want to go in, in the cube style. If you limit yourself to two dimensions, then the best result currently is if you have three qubit GHC states, as shown here, these three qubit entangled states, then you just need 75% fusion success rate. That's basically shown here, the rate, success rate. That at the end, you have a connected graph. Okay? By that, if you know which of the bonds fail, you can still progress in, in, in a way that at the end you have a cluster state where you can transfer information from the beginning to the end. Okay? If, you're happy, if you can work in 3D, the bound is way long. It's currently 59% in this regime. So what do people have in mind? To yes, it's, it's, pure, uh, it's basically pure optics. But yes, yes, that's basically proof. And that's, so people have in mind to come to the next slide with that. Is, well, they said, great. So the first question is, how do we get 75%? As I said, linear optics is 50%. How can we do it better? Well, you can do better if you're happy to add some more extra photons. So there are a few schemes. The most, the, the most feasible one is this one, where you add just two extra photons. You build this kind of little beast, this little interferometer, where these two extra photons enhance the probability to, to have uh, increased success rates for the gate. So with this current interferometer, you have 75% success rate for fusion. So if you imagine you could build this on a high level that just works all the time, then you have your fusion gates on this kind of uh, network. Now what people aim to do is, well, you start with those three qubit GHC states. Um, as shown here, you have this kind of boosted fusion gates. That's the name, boosted, because it's 75% of 50. And then basically you, you fuse them together. And here, is the, basically, you see the directions. If you have three pairs, then you have the case where you win. Okay? Then you basically have this nice connection of the cluster state as you want. If you fail because, for example, one bond doesn't work, you have this, this connection, or that, that, that this connection, or both fails can also happen, then you end up here. But the point is, you can build everything in a pure passive way. So you just need to know if, if this gate worked or didn't work, and then you can route the photons by switching. So actually, at the end, it's a pure passive linear optic solution. It doesn't require any overheads in terms of active uh, or real interactions to enable universal computing. Okay? That's basically my quick summary about those concepts that currently exist as the best blueprints and are pursued by uh, PsyQuantum, you know, the spin-off company in California, and others in Europe to, to say, yes, this, this can be done. So what's the challenge? Well, it sounds easy, but it's still hard because you need free photons in your hand on demand without losses. So loss, of course, is, is still a, a problem. We don't know yet um, what's the current threshold. It's in current investigation. But people have in mind to build silicon photonics we just have just, if you have 18 photons in your hand, you have a scalable computer. That's the bold claim. And it works in the way that you build those, um, you have on demand these free photon GHC states. Very hard still because on demand means you must know they are there, the photons. Okay? And you have, ignore, so you handle loss already, you handle all the issues already. But imagine this is possible and you need just those 18 photons with this uh, boosted fusion gates. Again, they also need two extra photons. And then people, uh, realized, well, if you build it in a smart configuration, then you need the longest delay line you need is 30 meters of fiber, basically, which people think can be done in integrated optics or not. I'm not sure, but in principle, by having this number of photons and passive optical elements like fiber delays and then some switches, no memory, okay, that's important. You could, in principle, have this processor unit that allows you to continuously process the photons in this fashion, which is... Um, it's a very nice uh, article by Gary Rudolph, which basically is currently the, 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 our blueprint in the photonics community, how photonic quantum computing could work at the end. Okay? But there's still a lot, of to, a lot of improvement possible. So if you have any crazy ideas about how measurement-based schemes can be even further boosted or has basically higher thresholds, I guess you would have stronger results along this line as now a few groups try to improve those things. Good. So the last slide before I come to really what we do in Vienna is um, the take home message is if you have free photons on demand, these so-called GHC states, you know, um, you have almost the hardest thing is done. <coughs> then you just need basically um, smart arrangements, delay lines, and active switches with, with very little loss, which allows you to have in this uh, linear optic way then to process those GHC states for a universal quantum computer. Um, that's what people pursue. Good. Since that seems still hard, we, people like us like to investigate other, other directions, other possibilities. And we like science also, so we like to investigate 
Is there anything that can be boosted by photon interactions? This opens the door to nonlinear uh, gates, nonlinear quantum computing. Now I have a teaser here because we have not published yet the results. We work with graphene. So graphene currently is, a, as you know, this monolayer of carbon. has an extremely high nonlinearity. Okay? And the ideas in the few papers, including one from Michel Lukin, these out there that if you manage to excite the plasma in the graphene, you have a very strong interaction because you can find the light to a million times smaller mode volume because you know wavelength goes down to thousands in each direction of the, of the wavelength, which allows you to have access to very strong, effective photon photon interactions on linearity. There are proposals for building photon sources out of that, but the thing that we had in mind is we would like to use graphene. As, let, let me first explain with my hands and then I show it through the slide. We take graphene, we put it on beam splitters, and magically the light gets absorbed also by graphene, and it changes the statistics. So the nonlinearity on graphene basically makes a beam splitter that the 50% is, is not anymore the standard rate to win. You can boost it up to 60, 70, 90, ideally up to 100% if the graphene works uh, all the time. Well, of course, there's a challenge. The light must be absorbed. You have a small interaction with graphene. So we assume for now, once we have this plasma generated, how good does it work in principle? And the ideas go back to, to people here, John Hopkins, but Pippin and Franzen, who thought about those gates, how can you boost them? And they had atoms in mind that by the Zeno effect um, uh, would suppress the wrong events and put the good events. So let me explain now in more, more detail what it means. So at the end of a beam splitter, you might, would like to suppress the case that, for example, the photon sponge. Okay? You would like to have to always go to different ports, which would be then the gate that you would like to have. And for that, you would like to have the case that you put atoms or graphene there, a very strong two photon absorption, okay? But then you probe the system all the time and you avoid that this is happening. It's the so called scene effect, and people have had tons of papers about it. Other hand, you want to have that the single photon propagation is enhanced. So basically, it travels nicely through, and that's basically encouraged that this happens more likely. And, there, and there's a few, well, that's the idea. The challenge is to find a material where the one photon absorption uh, or the transmission is enhanced, and the two photon is very strong. So it's not very easy to get those things. And graphene allows you to do that. And, and nowadays, so the challenge is the one photon or the plasma lifetime is normally short in graphene. But it turned out if you make graphene nicely, high quality, and really you can dope it, and you have very long, so it's one over the lifetime, okay? Um, uh, graphene life of the plasma, which in principle allows you to have efficiency of high 90% for such a gain. So what we do is right now we take graphene, but we have to learn the hard way as photon guys. We've never worked with graphene before. Well, it's not so easy. So at the end, you have to work with plasmons, with different physics, and we have to see how it, how it goes. And then we, we learned that you enhance plasmons by putting an antenna on top. Okay? So what you do is you put this gold um, a metal on top of graphene, which enhances the plasmons in there. And by that, we work now. So I thought it's a quick experiment. We started five years ago, and now after five years, we finally learned the, the, the tricks and the material properties that we see those results. What we do is right now, we have seen our, we investigate the, the chi 3 effect, which wasn't done yet. We have seen an enhancement effect of 150 um, of the 4 wave mixing by having planar graphene and our, non, our gold antenna on top, which is nice on its own. We play with the properties of graphene that we say we, we apply current, it shifts the band structures around. And if you put them at the right, you see this, this right, well, it's 4 wave mixing, so we need four laser four fields, three we put in as the laser. The one is the laser, one is the plasma. So two is the laser, one is the plasma, and the last one is the signal out. So we play with these kind of conditions. And by tuning the graphene, we have resonance conditions for one, two, or three photon absorption. And they go nicely here with our current first experimental data. So long story short, it's promising. Uh, we see the right direction. The challenge is <coughs> the wavelength is bad. So graphene with the plasma like five, six microns, which is not telecom yet. But in principle, we see a chance to go there by doping graphene with current and seeing nice twists that allows to um, become a nonlinear material. So why do you want to work with those things? So in contrast to regular cavity QED, light matter interaction, it works at room temperature. Okay? No cavity, no single atom, no cooling. It's just there. This experiment looks super simple. It's just like a, like a mount, graphene, and then you play with it. That, that's something which is very interesting for us to think of. Can we, in the future, Think of integrated networks that we put graphene everywhere and we see some nonlinearity coming up. Good. I see I have still 20 minutes left. Is it right? Something like this? Yes. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. Yes. Yes. The phenotype, yes. It was, you know, remember the back in the days, John Franz, Pittman and Franz and talked about those things and couldn't do it if the atoms in the fiber. We tried with graphene now, okay. But it's a nonlinear beam split, but it's a nonlinearity. So at the end, I would not be surprised if totally the other concepts would show up because you have a nonlinearity that works nicely. So this is the straightforward from the history. Beam splitter that's nonlinear. So it's also like a single photon source at the end if you if you play with that. So the nonlinearity that you can Yes, so that's a good question. So it go, it, the change is even harder. How do you get the plasma in the beginning? So right now we have to think about how to get a photon basically making a plasma. So you need a nanowire to excite this, you know, this kind of precell enhancement of the solid state emitter to nanowire who makes the plasma there and then it propagates. Propagation is not a problem with the dispersion. So far we've seen that it works, but there's many other problems around it. So it's, it's, not, it's a long way, to be honest, but it's exciting to have this interesting material that, that might as benefits compared to the other light matter detections. Good, but actually the, the, the thing that we like to do is we like to investigate new twists. And now I, I go back to pure optics, pure photon experiments, and here I, I would like to show what we really like to do in Vienna. So as I said, security is something that we like to do. And for me, frankly speaking, when I talk about quantum computing, okay, the biggest impact is security. So for me, it's not so important, that that's my personal opinion to boost search or to boost factorization and so on, that's nice to have. But for me, this kind of security level jump that quantum is allowed to do is way more important, okay, in my eyes. Um, that's basically the next, the next two things. So I mentioned here Gmail, uh, Gmail and Facebook because nowadays when you think about our cloud computing network and you have a Gmail, Facebook, the only thing that's encrypted and secure is the communication from my laptop to the server. But everything at the server is plain text. So for processing the information, everything is clear again. And everybody has the server in his hands, knows precisely uh, what the pictures are, what the message is. So back in the days, I had a girlfriend at the bank, okay, it was high up in the hierarchy. And they had the fun to look at the bank accounts, who's the richest guy to hang out with, okay? <laughs> uh, super interesting to see, actually, what, what kind of people exist next door who have this kind of this huge amount of money. But actually, it's not what you probably would like to do. No? At the end, you would like to have some, if it's possible, to protect your data, but still have it um, in a way that it can be processed. Okay? You don't want to have at the end a noise machine. Right? And the, one of the fathers of this communication channel, this uh, Rives from this RSA code, raised the question uh, more than 40 years ago, is there any way to encrypt processed data? Okay? And for 30 years, it was a super hard problem for computer scientists who thought, no. No way, because at the end it doesn't fit together for mathematical arguments. But, um, um, oops, I missed a few lines here. But in 2009, there was an answer. The answer was yes, it can be done. And two solutions came up, a classical one and a quantum solution. So the, quantum, so the classical one has a huge overhead that's the gantry protocol, and it, it's not really practical in terms of resources, and has not this higher level of security as, as, as quantum computers do. But at the same time, there was this quantum computing result coming up from uh, Broadband, Fitzsimmons, and Kashefi have shown by using, again, this measurement-based scheme. You see this kind of architecture for computers opens the eyes and say, well, there's something different that can be done. Allowed to build a computer where you combine cryptography concepts with the computer concepts in such a way that they can delegate a machinery, okay, that basically be a client who, it's just a little bit of quantum power, can delegate a big computer in such a way that the computer doesn't know the input, doesn't know the software, doesn't know the output that he basically gives you, but still does the right job for the client. So the, only the client has the missing puzzle piece to understand basically what this, what this means. And that's super interesting. When you think about this kind of internet that you have such a in principle machinery where the data is, is really protected okay, by, by quantum standards. Okay? It would be very nice to have. So for me, that's really the um, most interesting aspect, way, way, way more than QPD and, and just the speed of computers. We really like that. So, again, how does it work? There's one slide to explain again the twist and the simple concept of blind computation. It goes, as, it, as I showed you before, with the measurement-based scheme. The only difference now is that each of the qubits, so now the qubits belong to Alice, and she sends you single photons, okay? Qubits, huh? polarization states. And for each of, the, each of the photons, she chooses a different polarization setting, okay? Just eight different settings are enough. 
whatever, H, V, plus, minus, and so on. But she knows for each of the photons what kind of state she had in her hand and was sending it to the computer, that's the other guy here, who has the power to entangle those. Okay? Basically, here's the machinery to make these big cluster states. And then she tells computer, please make measurement one after the other. And then he makes the measurements, he gets the orders. But he doesn't know what he's actually doing because to understand how the measurement here affects or becomes this state, you need to know two things. The measurement setting that you implemented here, that's this parameter. But you also need to know the previous rotation here that L is put by a cubic. Voila, as simple as that. So they throw away many other top layers of you have to design in a smart way the structures and so on. But that's the core idea. If you have an additional phase here, you see it's plus and then this kind of data phase. You need to know those two parameters to know what kind of actual gate you implement. And that's the idea that the computer will never learn, has no chance to see what's happening, but only for, for LSE it makes sense. So we did this many years ago. That was my, my kickoff in this field. And it was nice to show basically the, the primitives and, and show that photons in principle are also handy because they are there for delegation. You can send the qubit easily and use the same systems for making the computer. But um, uh, it was just the beginning. The beginning was that later on people said, well, if we look at all those things we would like to have, there's always a catch-22. Okay, so there's always something that's not making us happy. So people uh, realized that if you build a secure quantum computer, you cannot have everything at the same time. What computer scientists would love to have. So what do they want? They want, of course, uh, perfect security, obviously. They want that you can do all kinds of computations, obviously. They want to have, well, a little bit of overhead. Should not take basically more overhead than actual resources for the computing. And they would like to have that it don't interact. So to fire and forget, yeah? I give the computer the commands and just lean back and say that's it. Ah, always one must be sacrificed. So in the case of blind quantum computing, what's the problem here? Well, you have to, after each, for each of the qubits, you need to tell the computer, please make this measurement, okay? Then it tells you what you measured, and you say, okay, now I know what it should do. Please make the second measurement. So for each step, you need this kind of classical communication back and forth, which for a few qubits is no problem, but if you have many thousands, you can see it becomes annoying. And there's a huge field about secure computing. And the other schemes, very prominent other scheme that you even see in newspapers, is the so-called homomorphic encryption. Okay? Homomorphic comes from these mathematical transformations, which means the function doesn't change when it's basically uh, shuffled around. In other words, the computer means you change the game in such a way that the computer is allowed to know the software, but it doesn't know the input and the output. Homomorphic means the input is encrypted, the computer processes this encrypted data, and then you can still encrypt it, decrypt it. Okay, and that's the story here. So it's interesting for the community because these schemes have cases where they do not interact anymore. So you can really have a fire and forget um, computer, which is nice in terms of practicality. And we did something, well, there was a few concepts. We did something based on random walk computation. So what's the downside now? Well, you cannot have arbitrary computations. In our case, we choose a random walk instance, and here's a little asterisk. In our case, the photons, very simple, it's a good thing. The security is not at the highest level. It's asymptotic, limit only, perfect secure. But until you reach that, there's just a quantum enhancement. Again. Good. It's a tour de force by now, I guess, but let's go, uh, go back to something very easy. The concept is so simple, I like to show it because it shows that, um, so we got unhappy because we've seen the idea how it works. We thought, man, we should have done that by ourselves. It's so nice and elegant, but simple photonic concepts allow you to do. So as you know, these random computers, random walk computers work in the way that you have beam splitters and phase shifters. And by choosing the phase shifters, you can map a single photon superposition state, which is either this, that, or that input mode, to any arbitrary state out there. Okay? And it goes back to the 90s when people realized, well, Optics allows you to have this very nice unitary transformation where the input can be transferred with not so much overhead to an arbitrary output state. Okay? And it turned out that these kind of computing units are not universal, but they allow you to have, uh, you can do some kind of subroutines, you can do um, uh, searches, and you can do boson sampling, which was very late, an interesting result that such concepts give you results which are very hard to calculate for classic machines. I'll come to that in a second. So what you do, you basically build, take beam splitters and phase shifters in integrated circuit like this, and then you can build your device. I have one tease about this um, um, boson sampling, which 
means people have shown actually this Aronson Akipov have shown when you take photons, okay, and you send them basically many photons just for this network, they behave like bosons. Okay? Obviously, they like to bunch. When you look at the operations, it's linked to the permanent, which is like something you learned in school that's determinant, but you make always plus the signs, like what bosons do. The permanent is a beast for mathematicians. It's very hard to calculate, okay, and really, it's a class of sharp P, which is like salesman problem. But even harder than that, you ask how many of the best solutions do you have? So it's really hard to do. And people realize, well, if you have photons just sending through this kind of unitary, they get, in the sample, you get results, which is so hard to calculate that, um, well, it's fluctuates, but actually that in the regime of 50 photons and 1,000 paths, there's no way that any classical computer can give you the result. If you can predict what kind of sampling result you have, which is interesting on its own, because it says, well, with this simple device, you can prove there is no fundamental limit why a quantum computer, as simple as this one, okay, you cannot do anything else than sampling, uh, cannot exist. There's this kind of debate about this church Turing thesis, can we go beyond physics, classical physics, um, for computing and so on, and that's something which people like to prove in here. And you know, there is, well, sorry, there's for me a break with talking. What people do is they have these integrated optics, beam splitters, randomly, of course, it must be like not, 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 not very simple, unitary, send these photons, they bunch, and they look at the end, how they come out in there. Okay? The point is, of course, you must design it properly. It's really hard to, to, to basically do, to get the sampling result from those devices. And you know this kind of uh, special purpose computations, like boson sampling, who was the first in the field, but there are many others, this uh, random circuitry, and then this kind of other schemes um, kicked off the field. What's the first computation that can be done that goes beyond classicality, so to say? And as you know, there was this, this, this very smart hype from Google to have in a few days, this sort of one day, a paper showing they have supremacy, then removed it, and now everybody arrives. Perfect marketing. Now what else do you want? No, no matter if you have done it or not, people talk about this. No, you can only win. No? And if you say, well, it didn't work, well, we have removed it. No? But, but I think you put, your, you put your flag there. So I think you can learn something there. <laughs> so, <laughs> very, so, and as you see, even the economist wrote about the supremacy, as people like to name it. Uh, was, was shown by Google, but it's the beginning. So back to our little <laughs> smaller case, not so many photons, random work. How can we, how can we hide our computation? It's so really simple. The simple is, but as you know, for having photons in, to interfere in the chip, they must be identical. They must have the same properties, okay? Must be all the same color, the same, the, 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 the same, the same style. Otherwise, they wouldn't interfere, and you would not basically process the photons via this unitary. So now you've split it in the part that the computer is the unitary, Bob knows what he's doing. But Alice would like to hide her input here and then basically, basically decipher, encrypt the result there. It goes back to the basic principle of optics. So as we said, photons must be identical, then they interfere and they come out according to the unitary. If you put photons which are different, for example, H and V polarized, or whatever, different colors, then they don't see each other. There's no interference at all. They go through as, with this, as if they would be lonely guys. And this is the key idea that you have to add extra photons, basically, who are orthogonal, to basically to hide somehow your computation. So what we do right now for the computation is to you take your carrier photons with the information, you take this orthogonal extra photons, and the encryption is very simple. You take your polarization rotation, you rotate by an angle that only you as Alice knows. Okay? Then you process them through. They're still orthogonal, but a different basis. At the very end, you separate the good guys from the bad guys by undoing the same operation as you did here, okay? Just a local sort of basis rotation of the photon, as simple as that. And by the same arguments from cryptography, there's no chance that this person here can extract who are the good guys from the bad guys because he or she must guess the basis. If you don't know it, you cannot extract it, and therefore you, you jeopardize the result by making the wrong basis choice, and then you, you get the wrong clicks on them. As simple as that, okay? Beautiful. We like that. And we, we did an experiment. Uh, the challenge was actually, well, we need now integrated optics where there is no birefringence. It's not typically the case. So now we need something where H, V, or any kind of polarization are treated in the same way. So therefore, we worked with people from uh, Oscillami Group together who makes this laser-written waveguide. So they have a laser which melts. Beautiful. Take a piece of glass, okay? Laser comes. It melts at the, 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 the glass in there. And it gets rigid again, and by that it gets a little thicker because atoms shake a bit and then become more dense, and therefore you have a higher uh, optical depth, a higher, higher index in here. It's outside, like a fiber, okay? 
And by that, you can really have this total reflection where the light propagates through this kind of path. And they design the paths by that with this laser writing technique. And now they optimize such that the birefringence is very small. But the challenge is, of course, well, the losses for those systems are really still in the order of 50%. So, of course, there's a long way to improve the, the, the losses. Good. Here's the chip. And here, basically, is what we did. Basically, we had those photons coming through. We added here extra photons as tensillas, two down conversion sources, as usual. And then we investigated different scenarios where one photon and three ancillas, two photons and two ancillas, and three photons, whatever, all different combinatorics. And it was nice to see that at the end it, it, it worked out. That this, this, this particular distance just says how close we are to what we should get from our unitary at the end. And um, here's basically the security level. So if you have number of bases, of course, it really goes down. But in our case, it four modes. There's some limits. So we cannot do better than this kind of uh, numbers here of 25%. However, if you increase the number of modes, then it can increase, of course, the basis uh, with, the same, with the same steps. And then in, in the case of very many optical modes, the probability to guess the right basis where the photons are encrypted goes down to really zero. So that's the reason why in a symptotic limit, those things are secure. Good. I see it's like a few minutes left. With that, I jump over. Sorry, it took me too long in the beginning. So I mentioned something very briefly here, but I will come to the second topic later. So this security business opened our interest or kicked off the interest. Can we do something that's really useful? Okay. And honestly, I think that our classical technology is great. So our laptops, our iPhones are just beautiful devices. So from it's, my eyes don't necessarily need it, but everything must be quantum in the future. Okay. So we had in mind, can we boost just regular software technology by injecting a bit of quantumness just to improve security? I don't care about speed up. Okay. Just, just do something like this. And uh, we had this kind of debates for many years with colleagues, and then we learned that the things we talk about, if in mind, is something well known to computer scientists. It's a so-called one-time program. So computer scientists would love to have a software that you can use only once, and then it destroys itself. So maybe some of you might be too old, but you see Inspector Gadget. There was a comic when I was young, okay, like the policeman, this detective who got in the beginning. He's, he's very clumsy, okay, and always makes mistakes, but he makes mistakes in such the right way that he still at the end saves the world. So, and it's, it's like the gadget because he had this magic head, he could do everything with long arms and so ever. But in the beginning, there's always the same start. He gets from his boss this, this letter which, which gives him the order, please do this and that because that's the bad guy, save the world. And after reading the message, it destroys itself, okay? And of course, it throws it back where the boss is and he always suffers this kind of explosion. But this, that's a one-time program, okay? You read it once, it's destroyed. And you can phrase it of an Alice that somebody has a software, and after using one software is destroyed, and Bob basically is also happy because when you put something in the software, nobody can extract it anymore because after one run, everything is gone. Well, it turned out that 2008, there was from, again, the, the popes in computer science, like Goldwasser and the others, shown that this cannot be done with classical technology. The only way to do this is TNT, or Semtex, if you're more fashionable, okay? You have to, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you put it there, and after one run, you pfft, explode it. That, there's, there's no elegant way to do it. As a physicist, you might think that it's not the best. So people said, wait, quantum. Quantum is always better. Let's do something with quantum information. But then uh, it turned out, well, quantum information can't do it either. Because if you would be able to do it, then you would violate cornerstones of QKD. Basically, you would, have, uh, you would do this kind of bit commitment would be possible, other things, or no cloning. So you would really um, <laughs> destroy other fundamental cornerstones in quantum information. Well, we didn't give up. We said, well, is this still something we can do? And it turned out, yes, with quantum, we can uh, boost in such a way that you can do it, but it doesn't work perfectly. If a noisy software, there's some intrinsic errors. Okay? And the challenge was, uh, we wanted to show it, and the challenge was, can we still make it useful? At this point, I will just have one more slide to show. So what we do is, we now had in mind, we've done this. We took a classical program the computer down to the, simplest, to the simplest level, which is just one bit gates. Zero in, in, zero, one out. This can be done as well. Okay? As you know, the simplest layer can be still a one bit uh, truth table, which you connect them to behave as this would be regular AND gates and so on. That's so important. But we encode this in quantum states. We do it in such a way that the quantum states, the single bit gates were sent to Bob, who used it as the software, implemented his, his, his program, 
But you know, quantum states, once you measure them, they're gone. So basically, after running this once, you could do basically this computation, but then at the end, it, it turned out no way to extract how the software looks like. Um, I could talk forever now, but Mohamed, should we close to the end here? Or should we? How about this? Uh, yes, okay. Okay. So I will I really overshoot. So if you have questions, I'm happy to explain later. It's based on the concept of random access codes, but this maybe I can talk later if you want. We did this, wait a second, we did some millionaires program. Let me jump to the end. I want to talk of causality we did, but there's also no time for that. So with that, I want to um, thank the people that did this work. So right now, I'm, I'm just showing off with the feathers of the real experts who spent the time in the laboratory and worked with those things. And with that, I want to here conclude where I really did a miscalculation in time. Sorry, it must be the jet lag or so. I would like to show that A, photons, there are architecture. So I think even though it's considered as not the, the front line as if I and superconductors, I do see no reason why it should be not the case because there are beautiful blueprints showing can be done with regular photonics know-how. Um, I mentioned briefly that graphene in our case is an interesting additional material to maybe have a, a boost for computers by having this linearity. And then I spent, well, I clicked on a few, but I wanted to show that this flying qubit that can also be used for processing and programming is very nice in particular for security aspects where you can encode the information and still um, uh, process on a computer. And I had no chance, unfortunately, to talk about this superposition of gate orders, which again allows to speed up for regular computer architectures. But I'm um, sorry for that. With that, I want to say thank you very much for, for bearing with me this hour here, okay? <laughs>